There we go. And welcome back to Movie Conversations. Uh, this is Brian Ritchie. Joining me as always is Nora St. John. A uh, little technical difficulty trying to get, the, get everything recording today, but it's recording, so we're good. All right. So how are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I just got back from a little trip to Colorado. I'm about to head back to the East Coast for a wedding. Um, so I'm, I'm doing well. I've been thinking a lot about, honestly, I'm thinking a lot about the hips these days, although we'll be talking about the clenohumeral joint. So I'm thinking yeah. about the shoulder as well. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in hearing about the hips. This is good. This is good because that's also an area that I love to talk about. So we could talk about that again next time uh, or down the road. But yes, Today's sort of a part two. Last week, we did an introduction of the shoulder uh, where we sort of introduced everybody to the concept of, you know, some of the muscles, all that kind of stuff. I did I did a deep dive uh, into the muscles that are attached to the shoulder, attached to the scapula. And there are 17, including some that I was like, oh, I hadn't thought of that one. Because even like the hyoid, uh, the muscle that attaches to the yeah. higher bone and thing. I was like, oh yeah, I hadn't even thought it. You know, it's it's certain muscles that I just was not ready for. And I thought, oh, those are really interesting. So there's a lot that attaches back there. So yeah, it was an interesting sort of deep dive to do. So nice. You know, one of those interesting things that yes, we are nerds and I can't help it. You know, it's just, <laughs> we we get on a topic and we just start going for it. So yeah. And if you want to, if you want to take that back a little bit in time, <clears throat> Look at the evolution of the shoulder and the arm. It came oh, from yeah. gills. Excuse so me. There's there's an evolutionary connection to the structures of gills in fishes that then through a long, complex process of evolution became um, some of the shoulder, some of the ways that the, the shoulder joint works and the Interesting. scapula. Okay. When we just when throwing that out there. When you think about evolution and you hear things like, well, you know, the T-Rex was more, you know, like a turkey came from like a bird, like a turkey. It's like, wait a minute. You can't do a before and after picture of the two and see, you know, how that evolution <laughs> no. was created. And it's the same thing going, okay, gills to scapula. Interesting. I mean, I could somewhat sort of picture. So I'm going to have to do a dive on that. that that's going to be an interesting one. That's going to be an interesting one. Yeah, this is one that I've heard and I've, I've dove, dove into a little bit. So just kind of looked at some of the thought processes about it in terms of, yeah. you know, looking at just the evolution of creatures and when did shoulders show up? Because, you know, for a long time there were not shoulders um, and and there was not like a neck, right? If you think about yeah. a fish, a fish is basically a head and a body. There's yeah. no neck there. It's just a head and a spinal cord and then the muscles attached to that. So this whole way of having the head separated, which, you know, all quadrupeds have and, you know, many, many creatures have, is a totally different way of putting things together. Hmm. You're different than a snake or a lizard. Like reptiles, you know, have more of a head into body shape. Right, but right. mammals are mostly head, neck, body of whatever right. kind. Like it could be a giraffe or it can be a, you know, an ox. But anyway. So interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Well, yeah. we're going to be talking about the shoulder today. <laughs> in humans, in modern in humans. humans. In humans. So our bodies, that's what we're going to be focusing on. So uh, before we get into that, though, I want to remind you, please do us a favor. Hit the like, hit the subscribe, whatever platform you're on. Hit those buttons. Uh, give us a five star rating if you can. If you like what you're hearing, it helps all of our algorithms. Also, check us out on YouTube. Uh, it's under my uh, account Brian Ritchie, where you can see us, see us, uh, you know, live and in live and in person, sort of thing, and yeah, so we can do that. You can always get a hold of us on uh, Gmail as well at movingconvos at gmail .com, Instagram Moving Convos, uh, Moving Conversations on Facebook. That's all our socials. They're all in the description anyway. So let's dive in. Let's do the shoulder. So we wanted to talk about today, what we decided we wanted to, again, hone in on is the glenohumeral joint. We yes. talked a little bit about it last time and the idea of glenohumeral congruency and the small socket and the big ball and all that. We just wanted to go a little more deeply into the anatomy of it. And this is an area, as Brian and I both know, because we've done a lot of work on this, where most, many, many, many shoulder pathologies happen. Yeah. 
around this joint. There's a lot of things that come together. There's uh, tendon issues, there's bursa issues, there's joint issues, there's all kinds of things that all are in this tiny little space. Yep. And normally when creating, we think about the yeah. shoulder, this is what we think of shoulder injuries. Yeah, in exactly. Pathologies, it's the glenohumeral joint. Rarely is it going to be, you know, the scapula, unless it's a winging scapula or something like that. A lot of the things that we have a tendency in our practices that we see have to do with the glenohumeral humeral joint in general. And I would and I would say that's true at kind of a micro level, because I think, you know, probably next time when we talk, we're going to talk more about the scapula, because a lot of time it is that relationship between the scapula and the humerus that yeah. causes the humerus to be wacky or vice versa. Yeah. But the pain usually ends up somewhere yeah. around here. It's not I mean the scapula isn't usually just com uncomfortable, right? No. It's usually, and, and even the back of the shoulder may be uncomfortable, but it's often this, the top and the front. This is really yeah. where people generally feel any kind of shoulder issue. That's where pathologies you know, end up centering in terms of pain and discomfort. Yeah, normally. All right, so we're gonna be talking about the glenohumeral joint itself. Like we said last time, it involves the glenohumeral joint is the humerus. So for those of you watching on YouTube, you can see I'm holding up the humerus. Ball, Imagine right a here. bone in front of Brian's oh, face. Yes, a bone in front of my face. <laughs> and we're going to have our scapula. So that point at which that ball enters the socket. And we have the little bitty glenoid fossa right here. And as you said last time, the glenoid fossa is a lot smaller than people think. It's not like the hip joint where this ball would be completely encased with the mm -hmm. acetabulum. This really... I've always called it more of a cup and saucer because it sort of just yeah. onto it and yeah, works like its that. way around rather than a ball and socket where it's stuck in there and sort of, you know, glued into the joint capsule. Yeah. I think cup and saucer is a nice way to think about that. Hey, Brian, would you take a, that glenoid, uh, glenoid fossa and sort of show it at the camera for a minute? So glenoid fossa, right. It's like a little, it's like a little bit roundish, but what I wanted to point out, at least on this guy is it has this top, lump that goes up. And when you think about how shallow that socket is, we've, maybe I haven't talked much about labrums. Um, a labrum is like a, uh, like we've talked a little bit about it with the meniscus cartilage and how it changes the joint. But in the glenoid fossa, you basically have a ring of um, relatively stiff cartilaginous tissue that helps to deepen that socket. So that's the labrum. When you come up to the top there, there's that little pointy bit. And right there, uh, a part of the biceps tendon attaches on to that top point and actually becomes kind of part of the joint capsule along mm -hmm. with that. It goes right over the head of the humerus. So, and then if you think about that top part as well, so again, you've got a little knob on the top of that glenoid fossa, the supraspinatus a uh, tendon goes right through between the acromion and the top of that, um, that glenoid fossa. So you've got the humerus, you've got the biceps tendon, you've got the supraspinatus tendon, you've got the space between the humeral head and the acromion. Like that is a small congested little area. It's like the 405 freeway in LA at, you know, at, <laughs> at rush hour. I did grow up in LA, so I, I know wherever I speak. Yes, that area, we refer to it as a subacromial space because it's the space between or the humerus and the acromium, and it's below the acromium in a healthy shoulder. Optimum is like 10 millimeters. And we're it's talking like a young person. For those yeah. of you who are, yeah, who are not metric. And anything less than six millimeters would be considered impingement. So that's when things get really funky. And we're talking about four millimeters. That is a small amount of space to decrease before you start having possible issues. Right, so impingement basically means that that space is pinching, impinge or pinching onto those tendons and tissues that run in that subacromial space. Yeah, so Brian's again got just a, a little image up on the, the YouTube, right, where you see that, 
how that tendon goes over and how it gets stuck between the humeral head and the acromion. And you can kind of feel a little bit of this on yourself. If you feel the edge of your acromion, those of you who are not in a, you know, on, on YouTube, and you and you feel like the edge of the acromion, so you walk out to the end of your shoulder, there's like a little bit of a, a bony lip that faces more or less straight sideways. And then you feel below that, like your humeral head is, is not far. No. <laughs> it's kind no. of right below that. It's right there. Right. Mm. And, and, mm. and as you come up, like that, that space is going to get even a little bit smaller. And that's the whole thing that most people don't realize is when the rotator cup isn't working properly, every time you lift that arm up, you are decreasing that subacromial space every single time. And then all of those things that are in that subacromial space, like the supraspinatus tendon, like the bursa, the jo joint capsule, all of that gets compressed, gets squeezed. And anytime you've ever, you know, trapped, you know, had something rub against your skin over and over and over again, you create irritation. It doesn't feel good. Well, just imagine in your shoulder joint, you reach overhead, you reach overhead, you reach overhead, and you do it numerous times. That muscle will begin to get compressed. That bursa will begin to get compressed over and over and over and create possibly some irritation. And that can lead to inflammation. That can lead to, you know, issues. Tend to damage, tissue damage, that kind of thing. Yeah. So let's talk, we can we talk this in different layers. Let's start with those tendon -y pieces and those muscles and how those support it. And then, then talk a little bit about the labrum and the joint capsule and that kind of thing. So um, a couple of things about that. <clears throat> One is the supraspinatus tendon, the supraspinatus muscle. The supraspinatus is the most commonly injured rotator cuff muscle. Mm -hmm. um, again, if you feel your shoulder, it runs between the scapular spine, which is that big part that sticks out on the back of your shoulder blade. It's like if you come forward from that and you dig into a little hollow, that's where your supraspinatus lives, is inside that little hollow. And it comes you know, through that subacromial space and attaches onto the top, more or less, of the humerus. And what it's job is in terms of decreasing impingement is its job is to actually pull that humeral head in and down as that arm lifts up. So as you're, you know, lifting the arm up overhead or bringing it up in front of you, going above roughly 80 to 90 degrees of abduction or flexion, uh, that is designed to pull that humeral head down. So there's room underneath that acromion. Yeah. And it doesn't work. The thing to remember is that your rotator cuff muscles work together. They work, yeah. you know, so it's not just the supraspinatus, but the infraspinatus, teres minor, subscapularis are all working together to center that ball in the socket. And as the arm goes up, all of those are sort of gliding and guiding that humeral head downward in the socket to give it that space so it can move upward. But again, if the muscle is not strong enough, if there is something going on with that in the supraspinatus or within one of the other muscles, if they're not strong enough and they're not working together properly, that's when we're not going to see that humeral head glide downward. And because the supraspinatus is the one that's most superior, that's the one that's right up against that acromion. And that's the one that's going to get bumped up and continue to just get jammed. So if there's weakness there, if there's, you know, just it's not doing its job or the rotator cuff isn't doing its job, or there's just not enough space there. Some people just mm -hmm. genetically don't have a lot of space between their acromion and their humeral head. It just, it's not a lot of room there. Or somebody does a lot of overhead work. Think of pitchers, tennis players doing serves and swimmers, or people mm -hmm. who do like ceiling painting or sheetrock. Right, all those people who are spending a lot of time with the arms in an overhead position, sometimes they just, you know, the muscles are, don't have the strength and the endurance to do that in an appropriate way for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Or there's just rep repetitive slight stress if like, let's say you're a serious competitive swimmer, right? You are doing a lot of repetitive fast against resistance yep. um, uh, irritation potentially if that area is not working well. Yeah. And I find with a lot of people with this, it is repetitive use. Yeah. And it's usually something that they're not used to. 
it's one thing if you've always been a swimmer ever since you were a teenager or a child and you swam regularly year round, the likelihood of that being an issue is going to be less than someone who decides out of nowhere, I'm going to start swimming and I'm going to, you know, I want to do a mile swim in the next three months. I want to work up to a mile. Well, that's going from zero to 60 in a very short period of time when your shoulder is really not conditioned to do so in such a quick amount of time. Right. Or you think about, you know, somebody uh, or, or just over again, over time, you think about pitchers, right? Pitchers often, mm -hmm. that's why they limit the amount of pitches they do in a game. Mm -hmm. Right. So they're often like, okay, you know, Fred gets to come out, George is going in um, yep. because they really try to limit the amount of stress they're putting on that shoulder. So that their career can be as long as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So they're, they're, you know, they're getting, they know it's a little stressful each time, but they're allowing the body to try to recover. And that's also why pitchers don't usually teach, you know, pitch multiple games in a row, right? right. They'll, they'll take a break for a couple of games, dance, let everything calm down. And then they go back into that, that very intense situation for their shoulder. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And over the years when I was a kid, I mean, I was a pitcher and I was a catcher on uh, baseball. And, you know, when you're in little league, it's not the same as a professional because you're obviously not throwing at that high a rate of speed and for that many pitches. But I remember even in college, you know, there would be, you would have four or five days between, you know, your starts, uh -huh. you know, a pitcher doesn't do multiple days back to back. A relief pitcher might because they're pitching for an inning. They may be pitching okay. 15, 20 pitches. You know, including warm ups and things like that, they're pitching a very short amount of time. Whereas a starting pitcher, the rule about, I don't know, five or seven years ago became 100 pitches. That was yeah. sort of, That's that was sort of, we really want to limit and see no more than that. I was watching a game the other night, and by the fourth inning, he was up to 73 pitches. He was having a bad uh -huh. night. Dodgers uh -huh. are my team. And <laughs> The pitcher was having a bad night or fourth inning. He was already up to 73. And I said, okay, they're going to pull him out because he's exhausting his arm already. Yeah. And that's just it. They're throwing at such a high velocity with yeah. such a, a huge amount of power that they are causing, you know, micro damage every time they go out there. So they do need to have, you know, a week in between those hundred pitches because a hundred pitches is a lot, not to mention the warm up pitches before every inning as well. So they, you know, there's that as well. So there's a lot of repetitive stress. But what I see a lot of times here in my studio are people who do something like start doing painting, for instance, at home. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now they're painting the ceiling. So they're yeah. doing things overhead. Yeah. And they're not used to being in that overhead position with their arm for a for prolonged for a period of time. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, and... I always tell people a lot of times a muscle has a certain amount of tolerance of stress mm -hmm. for anything, you know, for anything. Yeah. You know, you can do it for a half an hour, no problem, or an hour, whatever your number is. But when you s surpass that, and a lot of people are going to surpass it when you're doing something like painting a room or, you know, hanging drywall or anything overhead, you're doing it for long periods of time, a lot of repetitions. You're going to you're going to exceed that at times. And that's when I see that issue coming up. Yeah. You know, that yeah. and yeah. beginning of the season, golfers, tennis players, when they haven't been pickleball playing for all winter, players, uh -huh. pickleball. Yep. We see it because they go from again. It's nice out. Let's go play. And their body may not be ready for that. They go from zero to 60. Exactly. Or zero, zero to zero to playing four games in a row or playing four days a week. Right. And yep. all those, you know, again, with time, your body can adapt to that. But if you don't give it time and recovery, like this gets a lot to that whole idea of allowing yes. appropriate recovery, which changes yes. a lot at different points in time and, and different different things that people are doing. Um, you know, many bodies can recover given enough time between um, insults, if you will, right? The tissues kind of get used to it and they, and they, they get over it basically. <laughs> that's an interesting way to put it, but it's absolutely right. You, that's what you're doing to the muscle. That's not wrong. No, no, but it's true. And the older we get, we need a little bit more recovery time. Yeah. And something that I learned, 
in my research is that the subacromial space also decreases with age. Mm. So mm. as we get older, it starts to shrink just a little bit, little bit, little bit. So as we're older, that space is already sort of starting a little bit smaller than it would be as we're younger. So that's something else just to keep in mind that they may need a little bit more, you know, distraction, a little bit more, you know, uh, something that's going to open the joint up a little bit might be beneficial for that client, especially if they're doing something like pickleball or something, you know, where they're going to, you know, overuse that shoulder possibly. So that's sort of that, that supraspinatus, that subacrobial space, that piece of it. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the other part of that. So I think about the supraspinatus tendon is going, you know, out underneath the acromion and onto the head of the humerus. The biceps tendon, one of the heads of it anyway, comes up very close to where that supraspinatus tendon attaches, goes through the groove. There's a groove between the um, the medial and lateral tubercles of the humerus, the intertubercular groove or the bicipital groove. And it comes up right next to that and attaches to the top of that glenoid fossa. So that's another area where you have a muscle that we use kind of a lot, actually, mm -hmm. right? And every time you bend your elbows, you know, you eat, you drink something, you lift something up, you're using that biceps tendon. And uh, it's interesting because there aren't that many muscles uh, or tendons in this case that go through a little bony channel, mm -hmm. right? So this guy, it's like, it's a tendon that has a relatively thick tendon sheath that protects it to some extent, but it still is going through a relatively narrow channel repetitively, mm -hmm. right? Kind of rubbing through a narrow channel. Again, there are not that many uh, tendons that do that. So that's an area where too, you can get irritation uh, if the tendon gets inflamed at all, so you've irritated it doing something, too much of something, then it starts to swell. Yes. If it starts to swell, then it doesn't fit in that groove as well, and then it gets more irritated, right? It's just like, yep. if I'm a skinny thing going through a big fat tunnel, I got no trouble. If I get fatter and suddenly I'm going through that same tunnel, now I'm rubbing against the edges of that tunnel and causing myself trouble. Yeah. So that's another place that you can get irritation in there is with that biceps tendon, uh, you know, again, getting irritated in that groove. Not only that, when it does get inflamed, I've had some people where it's actually, you know, sort of pop out of the groove. It gets too big for the groove, right? Yeah. And it's, it way. moves around. So, yeah. and usually a physical therapist will have to put it back. And when they do put it back, there's almost immediate relief because it's like, okay, at least it's in the right place. It's still too, it's still inflamed, but at least it's in the right place. When it's out, it's rubbing in places where it was never designed to rub. No, no exactly. And that's just going to cause greater and greater inflammation of that biceps tendon. Yep. So yeah, that's, that's a big one. And like you said, it's a very small groove. And yeah. when something is supposed to go in it, if you think of a pulley, and a piece of twine that goes into the pulley when they're made for each other and they mate well together, they work great. Yeah. But you suddenly double the size of the twine that goes into the pulley and suddenly it doesn't work quite as well. And it's rubbing in funny ways and then it pops, it can pop out or get in the way, which basically is what would happen here as well. It would get in the way in the subacromial space and begin to create greater inflammation, you know, where it inserts, you know, superiorly in the, you know, on uh, the glenoid fossa. And what, one thing that we've talked a little bit about that certainly seems true here is, and I'm not sure if it's really true. So this is this is a this is conjecture time, okay? Or this is just how it feels. <laughs> it's it's almost like inflammation is catching. Mm -hmm. And it kind of is. I mean, if if you get a really inflamed supraspinatus tendon, it swells, right? It's got all kinds of inflammatory stuff going on in there. It gets swollen. Just by the fact that it gets swollen from being inflamed, it puts pressure on the subacromial bursa, right? A little, mm -hmm. little sac, if you will, between the, the acromion and the supraspinatus. And then that biceps tendon comes right up next to that. So, yeah. so again, that any inflammation in any of those areas decreases that subacromial space and can lead to kind of a, 
you know, a viral inflammation of the oh, whole absolutely. area. It's a cascading effect. Yes. And I think this is one reason why, and I may be jumping ahead here, but we see, and I'm not going to use the word misdiagnosis, but multiple diagnosis yeah. of shoulder yeah. problems. Yeah. Because someone may come in to see me and it really looks like it's rotator cuff, but they say I have bicipital tendonitis. Well, I'm sure that's correct. But you may also have yeah. other things that are limiting your rotator cuff movement or that bursa may be inflamed. There's usually that cascading effect that it affects the other things around it as well. Right. So when, when Brian and I think about the shoulder, and this has been really great working with you, Brian, to kind of clarify this for myself, it's like, if there's something happening in that area, I look at the whole thing. Yeah. Like, how is the shoulder moving? How is the glenohumeral joint moving? Um, check out the rotator cuff, check out the biceps tendon. Um, I kind of I kind of like to check out the whole system because yes, they may have a diagnosis of a rotator cuff tear or tendonitis or supraspinatus tear, but that so often is accompanied by all these other bits. Yep. Um, so I just, you know, I just like, as you just kind of take a step back and go, okay, well, what's happening with all the other parts of that system? Because sometimes the primary pain is coming from the diagnosis and sometimes it's coming from an, an associated area. It's just mm -hmm. good to kind of be aware of, of all the pieces that are happening in there. Yeah. I remember my first orthopedic injury was actually a rotator cuff problem. Mm -hmm. And this is what sort of spurred me on to really looking at the joint because I knew my shoulder hurt. So being young and dumb and not knowing anything at the time, I thought, well, I just won't do shoulder work, but I'll do chest work and I'll uh, do bicep right. work. Right. Not my, <laughs> not my wisest moment at the time. This was when I was, you know, in my early twenties, late teens. And I just kept banging on it, especially the bicep. I just kept banging on it and it wasn't getting better. And it was actually causing more problems. And I couldn't figure out why it's like, but if it's rotator cuff, why, why can't I do bicep? Shouldn't be the issue. It's, it's down here. It doesn't right. have, exactly. because I wasn't looking at the attachment site. I was looking yeah. at the muscle belly because that's, you know, young and dumb that's at the time. About. Yeah. And it wasn't until later on that I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it's, it seems obvious to us now that we know more, but all that inflammation. And I was basically banging on it over and over and over and creating greater and greater amounts of inflammation and probably giving myself, myself bicipital tendonitis without even realizing it, right. you know, along with, you know, my rotator cuff tendonitis. So, yeah, I mean, it was, and it took probably almost a year before everything mm -hmm. finally calmed down. And I, you know, I got the right treatment with a physical therapist. And once I knew what I was doing as a youngster, I recovered very, relatively quickly. But part of it is stop doing what's hurting it. Right. <laughs> right. If it hurts, probably not a good idea. At least not at least not to do to the point where it just keeps hurting more and more. <laughs> but you but as you know, when you're thinking like an athlete, you're like, I gotta gotta keep going. Yeah. And with something like this, what I find, and this is with most injuries, time and rest will do a lot of good for it. So when you can allow it to just calm down a little bit, that really can help. It can help to decrease the inflammation. And then we can begin the process of rehabilitation. Yeah. But if you're just banging on it when it's really angry, it may not be the right time to do that. The, the other thing too I want to bring up with this, because we've talked a little bit about just that recovery time, right? Like this is part of that too, whether it's injured or whether it's just working hard. Mm. But the other thing too, Brian, and, and this is something that you and I really work on a lot. And this has really been, I would say, our, our way into this work and understanding the body in both kind of normal and pathological situations better is, is, is getting that kind of deep understanding of what are the structures in the area? Mm -hmm. What are they doing? How do they work together? So really trying not to isolate, but trying to look at like, what are all the elements that are happening here? Because yes. so often, you know, like I think about biceps tendonitis, for example. And um, one thing that I learned in doing my anatomy training and especially the anatomy in three dimensions where I really figured this out, it's like, oh, look, the pectoralis major attachment goes right over 
yeah. the biceps tendon. It's like, oh. <laughs> so, you know, if the pec is really tight, the pec major is really tight for some reason, somebody's deciding it's their it's their year to do push-ups, for example, right? Like I'm <laughs> this is gonna be my push-up year or my pec year, then that too can cause that irritation on that tendon. Mm -hmm. And it's not from the biceps, it's from, or it's not entirely from the biceps, it's from the pec being tight. Mm -hmm. So there's always that, um, and this is where I think learning, continuing to learn has, has been really helpful for me, for sure, is just the more I can kind of go, huh, what's, what's in the area? Think locally, and then kind of picture moving out, you know, what's happening in the mm -hmm. scapula, what's happening in the humerus, what's happening in the muscles around there. That often will give me uh, insights into particularly problems that are that I'm having trouble with, that are not getting better. It's like, yep. if I'm not making progress, I'm probably not looking in the right place. And I've got to kind mm -hmm. of widen my view and take a little deeper look or a little wider look at the whole system, because sometimes that's where the problem lies. Yeah. The thing that goes along with that, when you're looking at the anatomy and understanding the anatomy, is also what motions are correct. Yeah. And what looks incorrect. Yep. And I think we've developed our eye over the last, you know, up teen years. And a lot of times, what I tell people is a lot of times you may not know what's wrong, but you can see when it's not working right. Yes. You know, it's like you, you you watch someone walk and you can see that they're not walking quite right. And you're trying to figure out, is their limp on the right or the left? It doesn't matter. You can spot that something's not working right. Yeah. And that's something that I find in the shoulder, especially their range of motion will become significantly reduced. And suddenly things aren't looking like they should. So yep. suddenly, you know, the scapula isn't working in proper timing, lunar humor rhythm with the, the humerus and their range of motion is restricted. They're doing a little bit more shrugging of the shoulder rather than elevating from the arm. Uh, maybe they're doing more protracting there. Things just don't seem to be working as smoothly or stinted. And with that tight pec you were just mentioning, their pectoralis major, I find everything sort of likes to clamp down and suddenly mm -hmm. they can't can't even stretch their pec. It's like everything just says, okay, hold me together, tighten up. Yeah. And and all of a sudden they can't stretch their pec. They can't put their hand behind their head. They can't brush their hair. You know, women can't put on their bra strap. I mean, things like that. All these things become super restricted. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. Knowing the anatomy starts the process, understanding what the muscles do and what the normal motion is is sort of that next step. What does good movement look like? Right. And, and learning to recognize that. And that's just, yeah. and, and one of the things that I think you and I both said and certainly seen is as a human, you have actually been looking at people moving for your whole life, yep. whether consciously or unconsciously. And like, even if you're just walking down the street or in the supermarket, somebody with a funny gait or um, like something funky going on, like your eye will catch it. Like, why is there an mm -hmm. rhythm? Why is why is they why are they looking so funny? What draws my attention? And that's often when there's an asymmetry in their movement pattern, or there's a funny rhythm, or something isn't yep. isn't working in a smooth way. So thinking yep. about that. Now, the next piece, thinking about that anatomy piece. So we've talked a bit about the supraspinatus and the biceps tendon. Now, there's also something called the bursa, so subacromial bursitis. There's a, there's a few different bursas in the shoulder that can get irritated. We haven't talked much about bursitis, I don't think, yet. We, we covered it just a little bit last year. Uh, our okay. first, yeah, in the first season, we covered it a little bit, but not, not in great depth. Okay. So um, now bursitis, again, I just think of as being in some ways, the victim of all these other inflammations. Like it may be its own problem, but usually it's being, a, a bursa is a little fluid filled area. So it's like a space between tissues that has synovial lining. So it produces synovial fluid to create lubrication for that particular area. And if it gets inflamed, if it gets irritated, what it does is it produces more fluid. It's like, yep. oh, I got to lubricate this better. <laughs> And that causes swelling and that puts pressure on the tissues and that yep. often causes pain all on its own. Uh, and bursas are also kind of not terribly well, they don't have a lot of circulation. They're not, there's not a lot of 
uh, good ways to, to heal them up when they get irritated. So bursts is kind of, you need to decrease the irritation, which is resting yeah. mostly, um, and stopping that pressure on that area uh, and letting time do some of the job of just decreasing inflammation and, and decreasing the swelling. So that's, that, that's a particular one where time is really important with biceps and with supraspinatus. Sometimes you can use strengthening to really improve those in a gentle yep. way, not overdoing, but just gently kind of getting their, them working right. The bursts up, sometimes you just have to pause and let it yep. calm down. Yeah. Years ago, I did a talk on the bur on bursitis. Uh, and the thing that I mentioned about is a lot of times we think of things as a cycle. You know, one thing leads to the next, leads to the next, yep. leads to the next. Whereas with the bursa, I say it's almost a downward spiral because more irritation leads to greater amount of fluidity, which means it's going to increase, you know, it's going to expand and get bigger, which means it's going to, you know, over and over again, release more fl the fluid buildup and it just keeps going downward, downward, downward until you have a lot of discomfort and pain. So it's one of those things that does need to be taken care of. You know, I highly recommend among everything else. If you think that something's going on with your shoulder, please go see a doctor, uh, talk to talk to a medical professional because, you know, we don't know when it comes to that area. It could be bursitis. It could be tendonitis. It could be a rotator cuff tear. It could be bicep yeah. tendonitis. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much in a small space that seeing someone who has seen 10,000 of these in their career, they're going to hopefully know a little bit more, you know, about what to do. They also may, may say the, an anti-inflammatory might help or a cortisone injection or whatnot. I find for bursitis, unfortunately, you ca sometimes you do need to have uh, outside help with yeah. intervention of a cortisone yeah. injection or something to cause to rapid. inflammation down. Yeah. Because yeah. if not, it just continues to grow and grow and grow. So I highly recommend, especially if you think it, it might be that, go see a professional, uh, medical professional, because that can, you know, you can take care of that oftentimes if that's what it is. Sometimes something as simple as, you know, cortisone injection or anti-inflammatory can help the process. You know, it can speed that up a little bit. So just a little caveat. Absolutely. That's a great, that's very important on that one, particularly because there, there are things way beyond our scope that can really help with, with any of these situations, but certainly with bursitis. Yeah. <clears throat> now, another thing, you know, getting into the joint itself, um, you'll sometimes hear the term of a labrum tear in the shoulder. Yes. Right? That's another yes. thing that we hear. And so I, I mentioned earlier, right, that the labrum is like a built up kind of cartilaginous cup, if you will, that just helps to deepen the socket and help to create a little more uh, support for that humeral head yep. uh, in the socket when it moves. And a labrum tear, where it happens when there's enough damage to that joint to actually tear that cartilage, mm -hmm. right? So this is often, this can be traumatic. This can be from, you know, a fall or a hit or something like that. It can also happen from, you know, just repetitive wear and tear, uh, heavy duty repetitive wear and tear over time. Um, but but a, a labrum tear is, I think in my experience, a little more serious. That's definitely something that I find a medical professional should take mm -hmm. a look at. Uh, yep. It may require surgery. It may require uh, other things that are, again, way beyond my scope. So that's another situation where I kind of like go, things really aren't getting yep. better. Go get this checked out. You know, see if there's a, a labrum tear going on in there or something else. Because I, you know, something isn't, this is just feeling way more, um, serious than the usual aches and pains that I deal with. Yeah. Telltale sign that I find with labral tears is two things are going to annoy it and bother it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Compression. So let's say the most common is going to be superior uh, anterior. So it's going to be sort of the front side and a little bit elevated in the shoulder joint. And if you come across your body, you bring your arm across your body that may compress it, that can irritate it. What can so like, also you're trying irritate to, like you're trying to grab your other shoulder, I'm just for, for those who are right. not on YouTube, right? So that, that compression exactly. at the front of the joint. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Or overly stretching it. So you, when you go into a deep stretch and take that arm to the opposite side, you're now opening that joint. So now you're pulling it apart. 
when you have those two situations, you're just going to continue to either tear or irritate it. Now, there are many different types of labral tears. Some are going to be very clean and crisp, and it's just like a slice. And for those, doctors would love nothing more than to go in and put a couple sutures in and ta-da, done. However, it can also be frayed. It can also look like spaghetti, and in which case all they can do is sort of trim that area up. We really don't know, and they often don't know until they go in and take right. a look at it. Right. Because an MRI and, only shows so much. Well, and also, like, I think of many, many, many of the shoulder clients that I've had who've gone in for surgery where they thought they were doing this, <laughs> and they get in there and they do something else, right? That that happens really commonly with the shoulder. And it speaks oh, yeah. to just that point of, again, that cascading effect of, they think it's a rotator cuff. So they're going to go in planning to repair or do something with the supraspinatus. But in fact, that seems to be okay. But the infraspinatus is problematic. Or, oh, it's actually a labrum tear. Or, oh, no, it's a bicep. Like, so very, very commonly, I've had people go in for one particular version of a surgery and they come out with a doctor going, oh, no, what I actually saw was exactly. something related but different. Yeah. Yep. So, so that, that's just that, that confusion around shoulder diagnoses. I think I've told you the story. I had a client who was going in and it was just going to be a quick cleanup. They would be back to train within a couple of weeks, quick cleanup shoulder surgery. To me, there's no such thing as a quick, easy surgery, but I'm like, okay, no. I'm, I'm going to trust <laughs> the doctor says that. Sure. <laughs> he walked in the day after the surgery with what looked like a second head. The bandage was so big around his shoulder. And I said, what was going on? He said, well, when they went in there, the rotator cuff tendon looked like uh, the end of a mop. It was just spaghetti. And the other side was the same thing. So they had to rebuild it from scratch and basically put each layer together and rebuild all of that. And then there was the labrum they had to work with. And, <laughs> and he, I, he said, so it's going to be a while. I said, yeah, it's going to be a while. Yeah, and it was. Exactly. It was a little while before he was ready to exercise again, but his shoulder healed very nicely. And, you know, he was one of my most active clients, but yeah, yeah. they don't often know. Yeah. And which is why sometimes I hate it when a surgeon's going to say, we're going to go in and take a look and clean the area up. It's like, Oh, you're just exploring. Okay. Right. You're, you're not gonna sure go what's going what, on. Right. You're, you're actually for trying to, you're actually diagnosing. You're actually exactly. going to go in and figure out what's happening. That's, that's, that's exactly. what's really happening here. You can call it whatever you want a cleanup, but really it's like, what's going on in here and why is this not getting better? So yep. thinking about the labrum tear, a couple of things, you know, one overstretching, but think about sleeping. Oh yeah. Or if you're a side sleeper and that's Pressure. painful, like, ugh, right. Yep. Um, and, and just a little aside, if you can't sleep, you don't heal. Mm -hmm. Like there's such a strong correlation between sleep and healing. Um, and a lot of my clients who ha are having real difficulties healing, whatever the situation is, I always say, Hey, you know, talk to your doctor about working with you on sleep or whatever mm -hmm. tools they want to use. Um, cause sometimes that makes the biggest difference. I've had several clients, especially I think of like my postmenopausal women who are having all kinds of sleep disruptions, um, or a new mom who's having sleep disruptions. Yeah. Uh, and, and oftentimes if they can manage their sleep, a whole lot of just chronic inflammation can calm down. So just yep. a little something to see there. Uh, one other last thing that I wanted to mention. So we talked about labral tears, biceps and supraspinatus, um, is frozen shoulder. Yes. So, uh, frozen shoulder, again, it's kind of what it sounds like. It's also called adhesive capsulitis. So I think that name explains it fairly well, both do, but that's a little more technical. So you think about the labrum, you think about the humerus sitting inside that, that cup of the glenoid fossa. And that whole area is surrounded by synovial membrane because that produces fluid, which allows it to stay lubricated. And what seems to happen with adhesive capsulitis is that that synovial fluid gets a little thicker, isn't working as well, or, is, or there isn't as much produced the joint gets drier is kind of somehow how it's described. And that means that, that the humerus actually kind of sticks to the glenoid fossa or the capsule kind of sticks to itself and loses some mobility. Yeah. And the client typically can no longer abduct that shoulder. Yep. I mean, that's usually, that's usually the motion that gets lost as they can't, you know, lift that upper arm up. Um, so 
when that happens, there's several phases, but um, they call it the freezing, the frozen, mm -hmm. and the thawing stage. And yep. in the freezing stage, right, it's like they're slowly or sometimes very quickly losing range of motion in that area. And it's often a, a pretty painful time. Then there's kind of a frozen stage where it's just not moving well. And oftentimes the shoulder doesn't hurt at that point, but the rest of the body does because it's trying to compensate for lifting the arm from other muscles. And then the thawing stage, things start to move again, and you can kind of reestablish movement patterns. Yeah. Um, it can take three months. It can take two years uh, for yeah. it to go through that whole process. And, you know, one thing I often say is, is, is I've worked with a few physical therapists and massage people and stuff who seem to have magic when it comes to mm -hmm. speeding up that process. There's um, techniques. There's techniques. And I've also worked with yep. a lot of people who never find them and are just stuck with this for extended periods of time. So that's another shoulder issue. Yeah. When you're talking about the three phases, uh, think of it like a bell curve where yeah. you have your freezing stage mm -hmm. where it gradually happens. Now that gradual can be steep, but oftentimes, and there's a great article in the Washington Post probably 15 years ago by someone who went through all of this. And what they found was that uh, premenopausal, menopausal women uh, with hormone changes were the most likely to have this happen, but they developed some shoulder problem. And instinctually, when you hurt something, you don't want to move it. So she was told, don't move your arm. So she had put it in a sling and she didn't move it. And without moving it, suddenly she developed frozen shoulder over a period of time. And all of a sudden she couldn't lift the arm. So it went from being a little bit of tendonitis to being frozen shoulder relatively quickly. Yep. And suddenly it was, a, I, from what I've heard from most physical therapists that I've talked to, it's anywhere from 12 to 18 month, you know, span that is going to be from start to finish. And if you get in early when it's freezing and you can sort of attack it early, you can speed that process along and it can be yeah. as short as three to six months, Yeah, but you have to see the right person, someone who's going to do body work and is willing to stretch it to a point where it's going to be uncomfortable because you need to keep it moving. And again, our instinct is what it hurts. Don't move yeah, it. Don't move it. Let's stop. Yeah. And really, I mean, what I've been told by many doctors is you need to stretch it. Yes. It's going to hurt. And you're not going to hurt it. You're going to hurt them. They're going to be in pain, but they need the stretching. They need to keep moving this as much as possible. So working with their physical therapist or their doctor, we find what ranges of motion they want to work with. And we begin working with that. And it is, it can be incredibly painful and eventually it will thaw. And I find, I'm curious what you found. I find they get back anywhere from 90 to 95% of what they had before, not a hundred percent. They mm -hmm. get close and they're thrilled to, with what they've got, but you compare right to left or you compare before and after, and they still have a little bit of that residual functional deficit yeah. that they well, never a little, quite recover. A little stiffness in there. Absolutely. Yeah. As I said, the capsule just loses some mobility in that yeah. process. I'm assuming that just doesn't quite allow it to flow like it did. So for you guys, as physical trainers, as right, as personal mm -hmm. trainers or Pilates teachers or whatever you're doing um, with the body, when I'm working with, with well, frozen shoulder particularly, but you know, talking about all the rest of these things as well, with frozen shoulder, a lot of times what I'm doing, and actually for all these, I'm going to expand that to all these shoulder conditions, is I am trying to figure out what movement patterns are possible mm -hmm. without causing irritation. And uh, so, you know, because I know that client is not going to not move that arm if it's right handed and they have to actually work or raise their kids yeah. or whatever, like that arm is not going to sit there and it shouldn't to Brian's point, right? If I've got irritation and stuff, I should not stop moving that arm entirely. I want to yep. keep some mobility there and some strength uh, in the ranges of motion that are, are safe. Uh, and that don't cause a lot of compensation. The, the biggest challenge with frozen shoulder is that then lift the arm from the upper trapezius, right? Yep. So then that shoulder whole shoulder is coming up instead of the humeral head, you know, humerus coming up. Yep. Um, and that can cause some neck troubles and some imbalances and that kind of thing. So really thinking about what can they do that is 
not irritating. Um, I often start with very simple, very simple, no resistance, rotator cuff work, uh, with mm-hmm. just like internal external rotation with the hands at the side, the elbows straight. I don't even yep. do it with the elbows bent. Um, and I see how that works. And I really work on getting that congruency, getting that humeral head moving smoothly in the joint um, with almost any shoulder issue, even if it's a labrum tear or something more serious. I'll like at least work with that and see where we mm-hmm. go, see if they can get some, just a little support around that area. Um, if, if that, if, and when they start to calm down, then I start, and oh, I also, I really don't work above, really above 80 degrees or 90 degrees of flexion or abduction. Yeah. So I keep the arms below shoulder height, yes. right in that whole initial phase. And oftentimes that can work pretty well. Um, like I might do, for example, just a bicep curl lying supine with a weight in your hand or straps in your hands, if you're on the reformer and just doing a little bicep curl from there. Right. Mm-hmm. So just a nice, easy one or, you know, a tricep press. Um, if you're on, again on the reformer, supine straps and hands, arms are on the carriage. So you're not your yep. shoulders are not high and you just just pushing down, playing with different angles of, of the forearm. So, you know, simple, really simple work. Uh, I will do some mobility work if it's appropriate uh, and see if, if they tolerate it. And that might be uh, we call codmans, which you don't do with every exercise, but with some right. situations, which is basically kind of lean forward at the waist and you just circle the arm like an elephant's trunk. I often call it the elephant yeah. trunk exercise um, just to get some mobility going in there. Um, Brian, there's a specific situation where you don't do that. Yes. Uh, if you have a partial tear of the rotator cuff, right. you want to avoid that because that can increase the tear. So right, yeah, gravity will then be pulling it farther. That's so called a pendulum, which some okay. people will put a light weight in their hand, let their arm hang. Uh, yeah. Some people bend forward, some bend to the side, some straight up, whatever works for the person. Some people I've seen and I've had people do this, just a two pound weight or a three pound weight and literally just let their arm hang. Uh-huh. Because if the weight's too heavy, people have a tendency to want to pull the socket up to try and lift right. the weight. Resist it. To resist it. And you really just want to relax it. What I also will do uh, for myself, if the physical therapist is, you know, giving me clearance is just to assist that a little bit when they are lying down and just take them either by the wrist or by the elbow and gently just to sh- what's called distraction, just gently allow that shoulder to pull out almost, I hate to use the term out of the socket. It's not coming out of the socket, but we're just opening that subacromial space a little bit. Like if they were holding a weight with gravity and it's pulling down, you just want to open that area up a little bit and it just provides a little bit of relief. So again, if the, if the PT or doctor says to do that, great. If there is a partial tear of the tendon, do not do that again, because I've had, I actually had a client have that happen that had a partial tear that went into a full tear uh, with a suitcase, taking a suitcase out of a thing, out of the overhead and the arm pulled down and it just bang, pulled. Mm -hmm. Now that's 50 pounds. That wasn't, you know, or 20 pounds, whatever it It was. wasn't Wasn't a hand weight, but you get my drift. You don't want to make that happen. Uh, But other than that, Codman's exercise, pendulum, whatever you want to call it, is fantastic for that. And a lot of times I'll just have them sit at their desk and let their arm hang, just let it hang. And I got to tell you, if they have frozen shoulder, it's not going to feel good. Even the weight of their arm pulling down may not feel that good at first, you know, because it is pulling at that joint capsule and it may be a little uncomfortable. You know, they'd feel much better being on the armchair, being on the chair of the arm but it can definitely help. It's just going to open that area up a little bit. Now, so that often just really, it's basically all you're doing is trying to create that space, right? Yeah. So in an area that can be congested, the, the, my one caveat on that, and again, that's because I, I work with people who tend to be on the hypermobile side a lot, is um, I've also had people who really have shoulder issues because they are just, there is no stability there. Like that, glitter, that, that humeral head is just rolling around in the socket. Um, and so for those clients, that's where I really work on, on strengthening and I don't work on mobility. Absolutely. And those are the clients, I mean, these clients are generally mobile everywhere. So these are the ones that are, you know, super hyperextended and they do this test and their thumb, like, 
you know, wax their wrist and their elbows are hyperextended. And, you know, if, if somebody really is on the hypermobile side, uh, especially with the shoulders, I will really work on stability like mad. But that's no. a rare situation. That's not the most common thing. I just want to throw that out there is you've always with the shoulder, you've always got to look at the the stability to mobility spectrum because yep. it can really be from frozen shoulder to super hypermobile. And where are they on that? Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's not oh, like, yeah. like the hip, the hip has mobility and lack of mobility. The shoulder has like mobility and lack of mobility in a much wider it's huge. range. Yeah. Um, so so just being aware of where they are on that scale. And so are you going to focus on stability? Oftentimes where I start in any case, um, am I going to focus on mobility? And, then, and with mobility, I'm just a little more like, let's try this and see how you do. That feels better. Mm -hmm. Great. We're going to go with it. Oh, that feels like it destabilizes you. Okay. We're going to, we're going to chill. I like doing stabilization exercises in general for anybody with shoulder issues, because mm -hmm. normally the muscles aren't strong enough instability. Yep. So doing something even like I'm not even going to say a wall push up, but a wall lean, almost like a wall exactly. plank yep. on one arm. You know, yep. start on two arms and let one arm drop so that the arm that's weaker is just leaning against the wall. And I will monitor where their scapula is, where their humerus is, to make sure that they're staying in place and just have them hold it. Then when they're I strong enough, I'll get a ball and I'll yep. deflate it just a little bit so it's a little squishy and have them do do it with the ball, either make a fist and do yep. that. And what I like to do with the fist when they get strong enough is have them draw the alphabet a little bit with yeah, their exactly. hand. Yep. Just small things that yep. will increase the amount of stability in a small range of motion. Yep. And what's nice is if it's a pain-free range of motion, you can begin doing that early on. You don't have to you know, wait, because a lot of times doing internal and external rotation exercises with a band or with any resistance may be too much, but you know what? Isometric can work. Stabilization can work. Mm -hmm. So if you find a range of motion that can, and that they feel comfortable in and that they don't have increased pain, that's a great place to start. Yeah. Also I'll do the same thing on all fours. So, you know, the oh, wall yeah. is going to be the least amount. And then as they get a little stronger, I'll come to all fours and just even just holding all fours yep. with one hand and just see if they can keep that steady or else and i might even play with them taking the hand in different positions uh -huh. so just you know from palm straight ahead turn the palm in slightly turn the palm out slightly take their hand a little forward take the hand a little back um yep. and and just have them hold it breathe and breathe and breathe or you know pay attention and then change the other side so so ways to really play with stability and and a lot of times too that's awareness yes right it's like where is my humeral head oh it's 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 rolling forward. Oh, it's pulling mm -hmm. back. You know, it's not in the center. And so finding that place, find that ability to recognize where that humeral head should be and how to hold that together is, is also part of that goal with, with any of that yeah. stability work. Yeah. Something that I really like to do with these clients uh, in general, uh, most do need some, uh, for lack of a better word, mobility work. Uh -huh. And you can't do a traditional, what we would call a pec stretch, a chest stretch or a doorway stretch where they're leaning through because their arm yeah. just isn't going to take it. Yeah. I like to do a modified uh, snow angel on a foam roller or something where they start with their hands down by their sides, palms up. And I say, please keep your forearms on the ground. Keep your wrists on the ground. Slowly take your arms out like you're, you know, like you're doing a snow angel and stop when you have increased pain above like a two, yep. you know, and the range of motion is going to be limited at first. And I say, okay, let, if it's, if it's a one or a two, just relax, just try and relax there and have them relax for about five seconds and then come back down and do 10 reps, do a number of repetitions. And you'll find with each repetition, they get a little bit further and it may be mm -hmm. centimeters, but it's fine. But by the 10th repetition, they may be an inch and a half, two inches further. And again, that's today. You do this over a period of time and suddenly their range of motion is increasing and it's in a gentle way where you're not forcing anything. You're not asking them to do anything that they're not doing to themselves. They, will, they are in guiding with their own amount of discomfort. And you tell them a one or a two, just a little discomfort is fine and then back off. And I find that really gives, it empowers them to begin to, oh, okay, I, I can do this. I can go a little further. 
So that's just another helpful, helpful hint that I found works really well. Yeah, that's 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 that was my magic go-to. I had one client who literally she had a frozen scapula, not really a frozen mm. in a humeral joint, but her scapula mm. just she was um she was an she basically she was an ultrasonographer. She did um, echocardiograms. Oh yeah. And and which it's funny because I just, I just had one the other day, so I was like talking to her about this. And you know they, they have this wand which they're holding in awkward positions while they're looking at a screen and doing a bunch of other stuff, for you know long periods of time. So yeah. her scapula had really gotten fixed. And all we did was snow angels, like yeah. literally. That's all we did. Just the range that she could do, and uh, we would do you know. And one side she was all the way up. One side she was very part way. Um, and after about a month, she could she had full range of motion back. Her scapula was working well. Her pain went down. And now. She, I think she was at the point where she was ready. Her body was ready to change. Like I don't take, yep. you know, cause she'd been in PT for two or three years at that point. I think it was time for things to change, but that's what did it. It was just slow. Yeah. And she didn't, she was not on a roller cause she couldn't take being that sure. high. She was just flat. And one of the little modifications I sometimes use even for pec stretches is putting, I've had one client where they had pillows underneath their elbows. Exactly. So their, their pec stretch was like here. It wasn't yep. here and it wasn't here. It was like, yep. okay, the, the, the elbows were in front. The arms were basically in scaption and they would get a stretch there. Yep. And and then I would put towels under and then we would take like one towel fold away and then the next yep. towel fold away. So yep. different different ways to, to play with that. Absolutely. Yeah, I if I put them on a foam roller, it's usually a very small one, a spine fit or something. It's only an inch or two right. off the ground. Or, half or a, a half roller. roller or something. Yeah. yeah something that's not going to elevate them too far. Now, before we go, I do want to make mention, you said something that is very important. For someone who has this, lying supine can be an issue because with their arm touching the table, touching the ground, it puts, especially that biceps tendon into a lot of stretch. Right, they're already and in stretch, yeah. They're already in stretch. Elevating it with a pillow, with a towel, something rolled up just an inch or two can make all the difference in the world to get them to relax. Exactly. When they are in pain, they're going to tighten up. You need to get them to relax. So just by elevating that arm just a little bit, they're going to be, oh, okay, they can relax. And you're going to see the tissue begin to release and just relax a little bit. And that's huge. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, we covered the glenar humor joint pretty well today. I think we don't, lot, did a pretty deep dive. <laughs> a lot of different issues, a little tiny. And we talked a little bit more about um, some exercises in, in the last session too. Yep. Because we didn't really go into exercise. It was really more about just what's happening in there and things to think about. Yeah. So um, we wanted to give you a couple of things that you could play with, you yeah. know, and, you know, next session we can do more exercise based stuff. Uh, but yeah, some things to play with. And again, I think in general, when it comes to the shoulder, a lot of times you have to allow time for things to heal, stay in a pain-free range of motion or a minimal discomfort yeah. range yeah. of motion. Yeah. Cause sometimes yeah. no matter what you do is going to hurt yeah. and just do what you can do to get them to move through a range of motion. You know, that's going to be mild, you know, limited amount of discomfort. That's where we start. Yep. That's where we start. And then slowly build that up as their inflammation goes down. And just like with anything else, if things get worse, right, if their symptoms really start to get worse, send them back to their medical professional, try to figure out what's going on. Right. Yep. Like that's just, that's just what we do. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thanks so much for joining us again. I think we did a nice deep dive here. Uh, you can always reach us movingconvos at gmail.com. Check us out uh, on Instagram at movingconvos. And for Nora St. John and Brian Ritchie, we'll see you next week. Thanks, guys. <laughs>